Hey everyone, welcome. I am Tracy Guy Decker, Deputy Director at the Jewish Museum of Maryland. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's presentation, Current Voices, Uprising Plus Five, Activists. I first wanna ask for your patience with any technical glitches that might occur this evening. If you have any technical challenges during the talk, please use the chat feature, which can be accessed, it can be accessed by clicking the chat button at the bottom of your screen. Behind the scenes, our programs team will be monitoring the chat and they will attempt to assist you. If we were in the museum right now, this would be the point in the introduction when I would ask you to silence your cell phone. Tonight, instead, I ask that you keep your microphones muted and submit questions via the chat feature for our panelists to answer in a Q&A at the end of the talk. For those of you new to Zoom, we recommend that you select the speaker view option rather than the Brady Bunch style grid you may be seeing at present. To do this, please look to the top right corner of the window and select the words speaker view. Finally, when the presentation ends, or if you need to leave early, simply click the word leave at the bottom of your screen to exit. Next, a few thank yous. I want to express my gratitude to the team at the Lewis, especially D'Amica, Alyssa, and of course, Jackie, who will be your moderator this evening. I'm also very excited and grateful to be in the virtual presence of the panelists you will be meeting shortly. And I would be remiss if I didn't thank the Open Society Institute Baltimore, who provided support for tonight's event, as well as the virtual exhibit, grayinblackandwhite.com, which if you haven't spent time there yet, I highly recommend you visit. When I have spoken to community members and reporters about this constellation of projects marking the anniversary of the Baltimore uprising, one of the questions that often comes up is why? Why is the Jewish Museum of Maryland involved in this project? The question is both simply phrased and contains a complex network of assumptions behind it. I will do my best to answer both the simple question and respond to the assumptions. First, at JMM, we regularly assert that Maryland Jewish history is Maryland history. And since we make that assertion, we must value and amplify its corollary. Maryland African American history is Maryland history. That is why working with our colleagues at the Lewis was so important for this project. Our two institutions are located only blocks away from one another when we are able to inhabit, inhabit our physical spaces. And the work we do can be similarly proximate connecting in fascinating ways. When we work together, we are able to deepen the conversation for both of our core constituencies. And I am truly grateful for that partnership. Second, at JMM, we know that the Jewish community of Maryland is diverse and multi-ethnic. When most of us think of American Jews, we imagine white-skinned Ashkenazi Jews. And though there are a lot of us, I am one, the Jewish community is made up of white, black, and brown people, which means that institutional and structural racism, the root causes of the Baltimore uprising, are Jewish issues. I was especially excited about the idea of tonight's panel, women activists working to address structural inequalities and inequities, because it resonates so well with some of my own Jewish sheroes activists from history like Clara Lemlich, who fought for garment workers' rights around the turn of the 20th century. Baltimore's own Henrietta Zold, who fought for equal access to health care in America and in the land of Israel, and even today's Gloria Steinem. Like Lemlich, Zold, and Steinem, the women you are about to meet this evening are working tireless, tirelessly, not for recognition or for accolades, but to make the world a better and more equitable place for all of us. I have a feeling they will all be, they will all be all of our sheroes by the end of the evening. And now to your moderator for this evening, another shero, Jackie Copeland. Jacqueline Copeland has a lifelong passion for art, culture, and history. 
The executive director of the Reginald F. Lewis Museum of Maryland African American History and Culture, Copeland is an art historian and experienced museum professional. In 2011, she discovered in a Baltimore antique shop a heretofore unknown and rare photograph, circa 1872 to 1878, of African American sculptor Edmonia Lewis. She has served as an adjunct professor of art history, African American art and museum studies in colleges and universities in Illinois, Minnesota, and most recently nine years at Towson University. The recipient of many awards and honors, in, including being one of Baltimore Sun's 25 women to watch, Copeland also serves as a curator of private collections, a museum consultant, and a peer reviewer for the American Alliance of Museums. Copeland sits on the board of Baltimore's Downtown Partnership and the Maryland State Arts Council. Jackie, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Tracy. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and um, I wholeheartedly agree with everything that you have said. It is a pleasure for the Reginald F. Lewis Museum to be in partnership with the Jewish Museum of Maryland. Um, uh, we are, as we often say, we are all stronger together. Um, certainly the Jewish community and the African American communities have a long history of working together and uh, we could have a whole program just on that. So it's my pleasure to moderate this. I want to welcome the guests who are here and I want to introduce um, their, introduce their bios to you, introduce you by giving you their bios. Megan Kinney is with us. She was born and raised in the California suburbs. Megan has lived in Baltimore for 11 years. She has a bachelor's degree in philosophy from Yale University and a master's in public policy from Johns Hopkins University. While she had protested a number of events in her life, she only began to internalize the depths of which anti-blackness and white supremacy operate when Trayvon Martin was killed. The death of Freddie Gray and the subsequent uprising of 2015 further challenged Megan to reflect on her privilege and led her to begin the lifelong journey of unlearning all the conditioning she, as an able white CIS cis woman had undergone. Currently, Kenny is waiting out the pandemic at home and continues to fight to, fight to free Keith Davis Jr. and all others forced to live in a cage. Lisa Snowden McRae has been working in news for over 15 years. She specializes in reporting on race, policing, and Baltimore City. She is also the editor of Baltimore Beat, a nonprofit news outlet in Baltimore City. And finally, Tawanda Jones. Tawanda Jones is the sister of Tyrone West. She and her family started West Wednesday, a weekly protest mm -hmm. in safe ground to speak out against police brutality and murder. She is also the founder of West Correlation. Jones and her supporters have moved West Wednesdays online, featuring the family members of victims of police mm -hmm. violence from around the country on a weekly live stream. In addition to this weekly work, Jones also works to change laws at the state level. She is the mother of four children, a pre-K teacher, and a freedom fighter. So welcome to all three of our women activists. It's a pleasure to have you on this program. I guess I'll start out uh, with the first question. We've already mentioned that this conversation is inspired by the anniversary of the uprising that occurred after the death of Freddie Gray, Freddie Gray in 2015. Um, could we start out by having each of you share a little of your personal experience during that time and how it has impacted your lives? So whoever wants to go first. Well, I will call on um, Lisa. Can you tell us a little bit? Okay about um, your personal experiences during that time and how it's impacted your life? Sure. Um, the work I do is a little bit different than the work that uh, Megan and Tawanda do. I, I think actually their work is a lot harder. I'm a journalist, so 
my job is to tell the stories, you know, I've, I've chosen to write about Baltimore, so my job is to tell the stories of Baltimore. Um, so the way that Freddie Gray's death impacted me was that it really helped me understand that like, there's a big gap in the way that stories of black people in this country are told. Um, I got the opportunity to talk a little bit about my experience as a black person covering Freddie Gray, um, reporting at City Paper, uh, RIP City Paper. So, so I think really it's been like, it really helped me understand that I need to elevate the work that folks like Tawanda and Megan and so many other people are doing in the city. Well, thank you for that. Um, Megan, can we hear from you? Uh, sure. Um, uh, I had uh, like, can you hear me now? Um, I had, yes. like my bio said, had protested for, um, but it was really, you know, with the death of Trayvon Martin and Freddie Gray and Mike Brown, um, that I really had to come to terms with who I thought I was. And it's not, I wasn't the person I thought I was. And I spent time protesting in the streets, breaking curfew. And I had always intellectually known about that I was treated differently um, than black people. And it wasn't until I was there that it became visceral. And from then on, I just, mm -hmm. I, I knew I had to change, unlearn and, and really deprogram myself and look um, and, and learn more and be willing to be wrong. and. You know, meeting Tawanda was um, a pretty powerful, life-changing thing for me because of the relentless pursuit of justice in the name of love. And so being exposed to, to anger rooted in love is something that I had not known before. So I'm, I'm really, really honored to be here with Tawanda and uh, so thank you. Well, thank you for sharing that. I mean, life is a journey and um, it's a privilege for us to hear the journey that you have taken and continue to take in your life. And this is a perfect segue to Tawanda. So Tawanda, can you talk a little bit about um, your personal experience as a result of the uprising? and how it has impacted your life. Yeah, so, yes, um, thank you um, for allowing me to share on this platform. Um, it basically affected my life even before the uprising happened for the simple fact that when my brother Tyrone West was brutally executed before Freddie Gray and what happened to Freddie Gray shouldn't have never happened. That's why from day one, my family stepped out on the front line, putting our bodies on the ground, and not only just on the front line in Baltimore. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. We can hear you, Tawanda. So, okay. So, no, so yeah, basically when the uprise happened, it really, it really broke my heart because we didn't want that to happen to Freddie Gray. And it just like literally changed my life forever. You know, knowing that, you know, we were standing out there fighting and then for that to happen to Freddie Gray family was a real big smack in the face because my heart truly went out to his family and then actually being there with his family on the front, you know, before the uprise happened, actually holding hands, embracing that family and just praying with that family type of thing and then actually seeing what you know transpired it just changed my life forever in the most profound way to know that the work is definitely needed great well thank you thank you tawanda and thanks to uh, megan and lisa 
So I um, want to ask you um, if you could talk a little bit about where we stand today, um, considering both what has changed and what remains the same. Do you see visible signs of, of change in Baltimore? Five years you know, now after the uprising, do you see any visible signs of change in Baltimore? Whoever wants to go first, feel free. So, okay, so I'll go first on that. Um, so what I see that basically changed, I see that um, now that the consent decree is here, it did bring about some change, but not the definitely change that we need. And um, the reason why I say that, because when I met our beautiful sister Megan, it was actually at like a big rally. And it was sad because here it is, she snuck in that rally and she had a water bottle, she had a sign and everything. But as soon as I got to the gates, they stopped me immediately, right? And they're like, we know that you are an activist. And I'm like, what are you talking about? We know, you know, you can't bring signs in there. I'm like, I don't have any signs. But the fact that I got mistreated like that, and the fact that Maggie just walked through, she didn't get scanned or anything, and was able to pull this sign out, hold it dead smack in their face, saying that, you know, Black Lives Matter type of thing, um, cell blocks for killing cops type of thing. I was intrigued and I was like, yes, but I knew that had that would have been me, I would have, I wouldn't even be here. I probably would be beat to death or in jail somewhere. So it's just really sad. So the things that did change was I see that a lot of coalition groups actually pulled together for one cause, one fight, one purpose type of thing. But the thing that is sad is that I'm still hearing on news, just like actively today, I heard that three um, more people were shot by county police officers, which is really sad. And then even now in the pandemic, you actually saw an officer that should have actually been fired and actually charged because he was actually going in the projects coffin in a pandemic where we're talking about the corona, the noble coronavirus right. being deadly and it's not a thing it's not right. advocating for you know change in the right way. He was actually coughing what's really still sad to me. Oh thanks to Wanda. Uh I see that you and Megan have had many shared experiences. So Megan, I'm going to ask you the same question. You were getting ready to respond. So go ahead and, and uh, um, talk for a little bit. Yeah, I don't, um, I, I, don't, I don't think much has changed, if anything at all, especially in the power structures and the power dynamics at play. In, um, I, I see, you know, let's talk about the spy planes. Let's talk about money, more money going to BPD. Like these are, these are, <laughs> these are two ways in which the most marginalized are gonna get harmed even more. And it's almost as if we didn't, you know, the people in power either don't care or they don't understand, neither of which is a good quality in a leader. Um, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's bonkers to me that we have so many people running for mayor that the, the group, the, 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 the candidates that's getting the most votes is the undecided group. And nobody is really talking about how dangerous the realities are to a point where, and I know that there's a political risk to that. Um, what is also true is that it has to be done. Um, you know, you have you have a state's attorney who says one thing and does another. Um, so, you know, I, I like Twanda, I do see, you know, coalitions being built. Again, this is like, I didn't come out of the womb like this. I'm really learning as I go. And so, you know, I can't really compare to what it was like 10 years ago, um, I, do, I do see people being more vocal. Um, mm -hmm. I do see, do you see more white people talking about whiteness um, and not being fragile about it? Now, so what, what does that do? That doesn't give homes to the houseless. That doesn't decriminalize sex work. 
So, you know, that doesn't take bad badges and guns away from monsters, like people who, you know, the officers who killed Tawanda's brother, they got promoted. So, you know, right. we, we can sit here and talk about what we've seen has changed, but it's really about has the power structure changed? And I don't see that it yes. has. Yeah. Uh, well, Lisa, you knew I was going to ask you next. I mean, as a reporter, you are supposed to view things um, in an unbiased way. And yet I heard you talk about you were uh, acutely aware of being a Black woman watching this. So um, how has this impacted your life? And uh, do you see uh, any signs? And that's the same question, basically. Do you see any visible signs of change in Baltimore? Sure. Well, I'll start by the thing that I always say whenever people use the U word in reporting is that unbiasedness does not exist in reporting. And, and, the, and the lie that that is a thing benefits whiteness um, because, you know, it's typically in journalism has been white people deciding what carries weight and what doesn't. So I'll start there. Um, but if we're talking specifically about what has changed since Freddie Gray, like if I'm a person that traffics in words and, and ideas mm -hmm. and thoughts, what I saw was a lot of people in power being able to pick up the language of, um, of activism. So all of a sudden people like a Marilyn Mosby are talking about, you know, uh, making amends and like, you know, being able to talk about like these, these, these kind of hippy dippy words, using this language and making it seem like, you know, yes, I'm, a, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna make it seem like I'm more just towards black people when it comes to uh, drug prosecutions or I'm more just when it comes to prosecuting these police. But we have seen very little evidence that she's actually more just in any of those things. Uh, the fact that the per a man who did PR was the, the public face of the BPD when this happened is now running for mayor should be concerning to all of us because it means that we've really given them a pass um, that maybe he shouldn't be getting. Uh, when you look at like the money that's flowing into this race the from people that are not in Baltimore, um, Somebody like Theru, who's getting a lot of money from the folks who are who are funding that the spy the spy plane that uh, Megan referenced. That's concerning, and honestly, like a lot of the people that were doing the work of activism and kind of benefited from the spotlight that was put on Baltimore after right after Freddie Gray's death. They need work and there's nobody there to really hold them accountable. Um, one of the stories that I did a while back uh, for the Afro was looking at sex abuse charges from an from a activist group here in Baltimore and that has pretty much been ignored. And I don't understand how, if we're actually going to do this work and actually hold power structures accountable, there needs, I have not seen that that's able to happen in, you know, in communities the best that it can be. So I, hate, I have lots of negative things to say, but yes, that's, that's what I see. Yes, yeah, so um, thank you for that. So I'm um, hearing you say that um, a lot of people were able to talk the talk, but not really walk the walk after Freddie Gray. So um, what, what do people need to do now? What is it that you would like to see, Lisa, since you have the floor, and then others can chime in. Uh, what do people need to do to help? Um, do you feel like there has been a, a lessening of concerns that happened, you know, five years ago? Um, and what do we need to do now to be more engaged with these issues? You just brought up a, a host of issues concerning the mayoral race. <laughs> Um, what do people need to do right now to, to help? Well, I think the thing, it's, there's so much to do. The thing that I, I like to kind of, my slice of this giant pie of work to be done is really ele elevating voices that aren't heard. 
because they're usually the people that are marginalized. They're usually the people that are, are most in danger. So, you know, listening, I think the fact that you guys put together a channel, a, a panel of all women <laughs> is amazing because that doesn't happen often. And, and so I think that's important, seeking out people that are literally doing the work, people like Tawanda who are showing up every single Wednesday for West Wednesday and behind Tawanda who's like been able to get, like, you know, nobody gave her her platform. She earned it by being just an amazing and fearsome fighter. But behind her, there's probably so many other women that just haven't gotten that same same thing, so it's like searching out those women, searching out those people that are most marginalized and helping to push them to the front of the, you know, push them toward the mic. Mm -hmm. So, um, Tawanda, can you tell us a little bit about yes. your work? Um, what are you doing currently? I've heard about West Wednesdays. Um, what else? I mean, I'm sure you're very busy. You've got four kids. Um, how are you continuing to fight the fight? Yes, just basically just advocating nonstop. Um, and then with the pandemic, because we're forced to bring West Wednesday inside, which is a little uncomfortable because we're used to being outside regardless of the weather type of thing. But in a great aspect, we're able to now connect virtually to different families around the world. Like, um, last week, I had Sandra Bland's sister on, and just yesterday, I had uh, a sister, Latoya, who her son got killed in Illinois and whatnot. So just bring those families, um, and then even family still here in Baltimore, I had Marcella Hyman on, and things like that. In the fight for Keith Davis Jr., that I just want to speak upon real quick. Let's be crystal clear. Right after Freddie Gray was brutally murdered, right, you had Keith Davis Jr., an innocent man, wrong place, wrong time type of thing. Gunned down by Baltimore City police officers. I mean, shot at over 30 some times, hit three times. And now, because they won't say, oh, you know what, we made a mistake, wrong guy type of thing. Trial after trial, you see all the dirt and nothing's happened. So what I want to happen is, I want to see right now we have election time coming up. And it's right. We need to get people in that's going to be held accountable, and we need to hold them accountable. And if anybody thinks about vote for the roof, just know that we'll all be through because that is an insult for the simple fact that he has five planes firing on us. But when he was pulled over, caught doing wrong on 25th and Greenmount Avenue, three o'clock in the morning, he requested that the officer took the camera off of him. Did he get shot? No. He didn't get treated like Keith Davis Jr. He didn't get treated like Tyrone West or Freddie Gray. So at the end of the day, we need to put people in and hold them accountable. And, and until we do that, nothing's going to change. Thank you for that. I, I sense your passion. Uh, we appreciate you. And uh, Megan, can I get you to weigh in as well? Um. <clears throat> Yeah, I think um, one thing that can be done now during, especially when we're at home, but if you can financially afford it, to give money directly to grassroots organizations or directly to individuals, um, individuals in need. Um, and the other, a more like academic thing to do is really understand that all of, it, it goes much deeper than um, no, I'll just say it goes, it goes very, very deep and that the judges who are elected have a lot of power and, you know, thanks to Wanda for bringing up Keith, you know, he's been through um, five trials uh, and, you know, I, I, I've sat in all the trials and, you know, watching this work, watching this system like like the logistics of it and all that, it's it's mind boggling how much power judges have and to watch them sit and allow stuff to happen, um, you know, lies like flat out contradictions, perjury, and just let it happen and then hope that. Um, sorry, my internet's weird. 
um, and then hope that the appellate court will take care of it. Like research who the judges are that you can vote for. Um, and the fact that judges run unopposed, like it's a very intricate, sophisticated system that harms millions of people. Um, and, you know, and it treats me differently than it treats Tawana and it treats me differently than it treats Lisa and it treats me and it treats me differently than it would treat Theroux. Uh, and it would treat me differently than it would treat Martin O'Malley. So it's, 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 a, it's a very sophisticated game at play. And it's, it's important to know who's in power and what they do. Uh, well, thank you for that. Um, Wanda, who mentioned that, uh, you know, she used to, in, in her West uh, Wednesdays, she was um, more present outside. And now we are in the midst of a pandemic, COVID-19. Uh, do you all feel that your, first of all, COVID-19 has, you know, disproportionately affected the communities of colors, African-Americans, uh, and do you think that during this pandemic, your voices are um, still as strong as they were five years ago? Are you being overshadowed in a way by COVID? What do you tell me about how you feel about the impact of COVID on, on your work and, and on how it's affecting communities of color? Um, so, uh, Lisa or Megan, you're on the screen right now. Do you want to? Think about that, talk about that a little bit, or I, I can have anyone. I think I'll defer to Lisa and Tawanda. Okay. Uh, Tawanda, you were the first one to mention COVID. I mean, we are all here doing this virtual program because we're in a pandemic. Uh, we were gonna have this program at the museum. So um, how has COVID, what is your experience with COVID? And do you think your voices are still as strong right now or what is the relationship uh, with your activism and, and COVID-19 at the moment? Yes, yeah, so I think your, your voice is going to be as strong as you allow it to be. And so basically, like, prime example, when I saw that officer coughing and when somebody um, sent me that video, I made sure I sent it to not only um, Brandy Scott, I made sure I sent it to the commissioner, and I demanded that they do something. And I got on the phone and I called the media. So, I mean, at the end of the day, we still, even though I feel like in a pandemic, it's really kind of hard because it can kind of lock you out type of thing, but you have to stay doing what you do, even if it's a protest, robbing, blowing the horn. Like they did a, a program where so when um, the mayor, he wasn't doing what he was supposed to do for the um, homeless. So what they did was they got in their cars and they kept blowing the horns and they got his attention. And, you know, so there's ways that we can still be active and heard. So any type of situation, if you're a fighter, you will fight your way through, even though it may get odd, it may get a little tough, but just by the grace of God and by the strength, you can always make things happen. Well, thank you for that. So um, Lisa, you're on um kind of the front lines a little bit you have the power of the press um what are your thoughts on uh, covid yeah, so and the activism that we that they started like five years ago just just around freddie gray yeah i mean i have absolute faith in people like tawanda being like they you know they already have been making magic out of nothing so that's going to continue um Again, the thing that I worry about, um, in addition to being the editor of the Baltimore Bee, I'm also an executive producer over at the Real News Network, which is based here in Baltimore, actually not too far from where you guys are at the Reginald F. Lewis Museum. Um, and we used to have these gatherings uh, called Real Talk, though, where we could kind of discuss things. And we've had them over in, um, in Ida, Ida B's table. And that was the thing that when I got there, I was like, we need to get like in the community because we all know that Baltimore has a terrible <laughs> public transportation system. And so, you know, it's very hard for a lot of the people that would benefit from these conversations to get all the way downtown, you know, to come to Ida B's table to have these conversations. So we wanted to go out into the community and have them. That's not going to be able to happen anymore. 
So we're all kind of forced online. But then we run into the issue that is so prevalent in Baltimore, where there's so many people in the city that do not have internet access. Like for somebody like me, my hand, my phone is literally like, soon it will be welded to my hand. So I'm always online. But there are so many people that will miss these conversations because they already had like, they were super busy raising kids, keeping, their, keeping food on their table, getting on the bus to figure, or a bunch of buses to figure out how to get to like, Ida B's table or the Reginald F. Lewis or the, you know, the Jewish Museum of Maryland. And now it's like, okay, well now I gotta get my kid quiet so that I can log on to a Zoom call on top of all that. Like it's, it's, it's another challenge and it's really hard. Like I, you know, we have to, we're gonna figure it out because we have to, but it just feels kind of overwhelming. And then for me as a reporter, I'm logging on every day and seeing just like waves of reporters being let go the Sun has, is basically our only, you know, our largest kind of our paper of record right now. They're fighting to hold on and get some, some semblance of journalism going outside of their terrible corporate o overlords. But nationally, like journalists are being let go left and right. And it's, all of these are just giant hurdles that we're going to have to figure out how to, how to overcome. Right. Yeah, there certainly is, uh, there's no question that um, the press is uh, being maligned in all phases of our life and mm -hmm. coming from the top, you know, so uh, unjustly so, because I think that you are the voice of the people, that you are the voice of democracy, and it should not ever be silenced. And it really is a travesty that so many reporters and papers uh, are going out of business. Um, so... Um, each, uh, any, either of you, uh, any of the three of you, um, uh, what do you think the, the country um, as a whole should take away from the uprising? Or are they even, do they even, are they even aware of what happened in Baltimore? And if so, what should our country take uh, from what happened here in Baltimore five years ago? From what I hear, I'll just jump in here. Um, sure. People, people like to send their reporters to Baltimore every once in a while, like the New York Times will send somebody, uh, the Washington Post will send somebody, and they never get the story quite right. <laughs> Even like when the <laughs> uprising was happening, people were coming in here and like showing, you know, places that were dilapidated, like that was part of the uprising, and like, that was already like that. <laughs> Yeah. Like a long I remember time. that. I remember that. Like Baltimore is a is a is an interesting place. Like there's a, there's a lot of lessons to learn from here uh, from Black people. It's a majority Black city, but you have to, from a reporter standpoint or journalist standpoint, even just people that want to know, you got to actually be able to like do the work and listen. Mm -hmm. So that's just what I, I guess I would. Yeah, I would. yeah, that's good. Um, Megan, any thoughts? on that, like what our country can take away from what happened in Baltimore five years ago? Um, yeah, just how deeply corrupt our Baltimore Police Department is. Mm. That, that, um, that the, the, the case against the officers that Marilyn Mosby brought was junk from the jump. Um, that, you know, the, <laughs> that kids were pulled off of buses and the buses stopped at the Mandelman Transit Center. There, there are all these things that most people outside of Baltimore don't know about that actually were a, an integral to people saying enough. You know, like mm -hmm. TTF, you know, they're, they're, they're in prison now very few people know that one of those officers had all the drugs from the pharmacies. Or I don't know about all the drugs, but two garbage bags full of stolen prescription drugs from the CVS. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so it's just easier for people to criminalize black people. It's easier for white people yeah. to criminalize black people. Yeah. Instead of saying, oh my God, this structure that has been in place for hundreds of hundreds of years. Yeah corruption and violence and it's a very very difficult pill for for white people to swallow mm -hmm. to, to accept the fact that what you thought 
was reality was all a lie. Mm -hmm. It was painful for me. And it's still, yes. it's a, it's, I still have to check myself all the time about where is this, where did that thought come from? Where is this coming from? Mm -hmm. And being able to, to manage that. And it's painful. Yeah. Uh, almost like recovery um, yeah. from addiction. So yeah. I think that people need to know the truth. And the truth is, is that we have, we have people who are violent and get away with it and kill people. Yes. And, yeah. and we're right. supposed to call them heroes? No. Right. So, wah, wah, but that's yeah. it. It's, yeah. it's, it's being able to say that the reality that's around us is a lie. And that's well, I appreciate, I appreciate um, your saying that. And as African-Americans, we are always aware of the, you know, how we are treated differently and how it's never going to go away. We know our history. And as Tracy said, yes, we all believe this is our shared history, but we are very aware that you know, what happened to African-Americans in the 1700s, 1800s, 1900s, 20th century, now the 21st century, it's still the same. It is still the same. So I'm gonna to ask Tawanda, Tawanda, you have a very loud um, platform here in Baltimore, um, very much an activist. Do you think that your work um, has reached um, uh, a national audience? Uh, do you think it's having an impact on our country, do you have any evidence of that? Yes, the evidence is when you connect, and I wouldn't wish anyone into this family of losing your loved ones by the hands of people that's supposed to serve and protect you. They try to make these things seem like they're isolated incidents, and they're systemically happening, and they're happening around the world. So we need to wake up, and what we take from this is we need to know that the media can be very deadly because they can make innocent people look guilty and guilty people look innocent. We have to be our own conscious consumer, stop believing the television and just basically do your own research because it's always said that in every story, in every victim, it's the same story, just a different victim, no justice, no peace. them on all levels. So all I have to say is be your own conscious consumer and just ask questions and just know that Baltimore, if we haven't learned by every man that we don't went through, we don't went to different men's commissioners, we changed commissioners, like we changed clothes. Like it is utterly ridiculous. Like Hollywood couldn't make this stuff up about the GTF force, about Detective Cedar. No one's talking about Detective Cedar who was killed before he was supposed to testify on the elite gun trace task force. And they want us to believe that he committed suicide. And one last thing in closing, we need to get the medical examiner's office shut down because they're very complacent in all of this. They had um, a way to get these killer cops off by lying in their reports and it's utterly ridiculous. If you look at all the high profile cases and whatnot, they always lie for the officers and getting the people off. And it's just really sad. We need to get rid of the Officer Bill of Rights. It's so much work that we have to do. The work never stops. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Tawanda. Thanks to all of you. And um, you're all doing very important work. And we certainly appreciate um, hearing your voices and sharing your stories. And Tawanda, you just mentioned that we should all be asking questions. And I guess this is an appropriate time for me to say, I've been seeing some questions come on the chat line. I'm gonna invite um, uh, the folks who are working this session to uh, uh, throw out some questions for our panelists. So thank you. Hi, thank you all. This has just been amazing to, to hear what you've been able to share this evening. Just really making me rethink so many things. So thank you. Um, so the first question that came in, and Lisa, I know you kind of started popping something in there. Um, can, can you guys tell us a little bit about 
where we can either read or where we can learn more about some of the work that you're, you're doing right now, please. Sure, I don't know if you want to, since I already put something, um, so I'm, Baltimore Beat is what I have, um, is the news website that I run, it's www.baltimorebeat.com. We're still growing, so we can't have stuff up there every day, but we do have stuff up there. Um, I also, like I said, I'm the executive producer over at The Real News Network, so that's, I think, www.therealnews.com. And so we do reporting on Baltimore, but we also do national and international reporting because the thing that I always say is like the problems that we face here in Baltimore are the same problems that people you know face across the country and in Israel and Palestine and in Germany like it's all of us, all of these things and Haiti all of these things are, are related and they're all important battles to fight. I, um, I'll just jump in. Um, I don't really have a website or much, um, many tangible things to show, uh, especially right now, but I am very active on my Twitter account and you will see a, a wide range of topics from unlikely animal friendships to <laughs> the debacle of the Lens State um, Unemployment website to information about Keith Davis Jr. Um, and you'll see I'm wearing my free Keith Davis Jr. shirt um, and I'm happy to um, have conversations. I have been speaking engagements um, about whiteness and, <coughs> and unlearning whiteness. So <clears throat> you can feel free to reach out to me on my Twitter account and that's it. Uh, Megan, just really quickly before we move over to 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 Anna, um, what is your Twitter handle? Oh, it is um, at expand your focus. Uh, e well, it, e x p a n d y o u r f o c u s. I don't really like it anymore, but I'm stuck with it. So, <laughs> and it was really about when I created it. It was really about. Um, being able to open your brain to more things in a very specific way. Um, so it was almost like trying to be big and small at the same time. I, just, uh, I wrote my undergraduate thesis on metaphysics, so I can, I like that sort of weird stuff. Yeah. That totally makes sense. Um, so Tawanda, if you could also please share with us um, where we might be able to learn a little more about your work, please. Yeah, so um, people can reach me from my own Facebook page, that's Tawanda Jones, and also I have a page for my brother, it's called Justice for Tyrone West. My personal email address is miss, that's M-I-S-S, T-A-W-A-N-D-A, -S -S -A -A, that's Mr. Wander, 17 at yahoo.com, and I'll be more than glad to connect that way. And then I also, they can find me on, on Instagram, Justice for Tyrone West as well. Great, thank you. I'm just going to share your Facebook page and I will try and get to your other one in a second to pop that in chat for everybody. Uh, so the next question that we had, um, for, for those of us that don't have a history of activism, what are some small steps that we can do, um, whether that be right now or and also um when things hopefully please return back to whatever our new normal is going to look like uh Tawanda, you want to take it i think you're probably the person that everyone's seeing right now is she frozen lisa do you want to take that one I'm not sure, sure. if so, Tawanda's getting us at the minute. The question is, how can people get involved? Yes, yes. It's hard. I don't know. I, I mean, for I, me, I just applied for Jess. <laughs> Maybe Megan would take this one. Um, yeah, so, you know, one of the things that, that when I really started getting out into the streets, right, you know, 
right after Freddie Gray died, um, I had n absolutely no idea what I was doing. Not at all. I just showed up uh, in Sandtown and was like, okay, I guess I'll just be here because somebody the day before I posted like, where are all the white people? Like, this is an injustice. Where are all the white people? And I, I was literally sitting on my couch and thought, oh my God, wh where am I? I'm literally sitting on my couch. So the next day I went and I haven't turned back. And so it's really like, it doesn't seem like a lot, but, but moving your body from point A to point B and literally showing up physically um, to, to witness what, what is happening and go to, go to, if you're in Baltimore, start, go to a West Wednesday. Uh, you know, right now you can do it virtually, but you, you will see love in action and you will see the need for the, to fight. Um, so what, what my, my biggest piece of advice for people who haven't done this before is just put your body there and then just see what happens internally and allow yourself to feel un uncomfortable. Um, but you, you don't have to know what you're doing. Just be there and you'll figure it out. That sounds like fantastic advice. Um, so I'm gonna see if we can jump back to Tawanda. I'm wondering, Tawanda, if you can share with us a little bit about how how people can can really be getting involved and also specifically um if you can follow on what megan just said and tell us how we can participate virtually in a west wednesday yeah so basically um yeah people can definitely participate on west wednesday we have an email list and if anybody wants to uh send me their email we can actually put you on the email list where I have my beautiful um, warrior queen, Hillary, who does a fantastic job on getting the um, emails out weekly and letting you know, like notifying you guys where we are or what, what page to follow us on type of thing. So they, if everybody can send me the email address, that would be great. And just basically, I want everybody to be their own conscious consumer. And also, when you see somebody trolling, saying or doing something stupid that you know that's not right, talking bad about somebody loved one, check them, check them. Because at the end of the day, there's a time for a beginning and there's a time for an end. And one day, we're going to all go to that place. I don't know where that place is, hopefully heaven, but we're going to all go to that place and you want your story to speak to you. History is his or her story. So you want your life to speak for you. And you can have it speak for you if you're sitting around allowing, because you're co-signing. When you see somebody talking bad or doing something bad around you and you don't correct that, you're just as bad. So it starts right there. Just having those uncomfortable conversations and just correcting issues as you see them arise. That's fantastic. Thank you. So I think... That gets all of our questions that we had pop up so far. Um, Jackie, shall I hand it back to you for, for wrapping up? Yeah, sure. Thank you so much. Um, I certainly want to thank all of the panelists. I want to thank the Jewish Museum. Thank the staff of the Reginald F. Lewis Museum because these are the kinds of conversations that we like to have. Um, we like to, I think both of our museums like to be a forum where we can uh, talk about the important issues um, in, a, in a safe way. Um, and you three have done that. I commend your activism. You are important voices that are imp doing important work in the city of Baltimore and across this country. Um, please show up when the president, <laughs> if he comes to Fort McHenry, <laughs> but um, uh, you are appreciated and I really thank you. Just want to mention that we've, we've talked a little bit about the activism and Freddie Gray and COVID. Um, the, this kind of program is so much what we do at the Reginald Lewis Museum. We've done a program for a couple of years now called Talks and Thoughts. The first, one of the first ones was um, Talks and Thoughts as Colin uh, Kaepernick, the new Rosa Parks of his generation. 
And a week from today, we're doing talks and thoughts virtually, uh, COVID-19 uh, in, in black and white. So I hope you know, some of you can tune into that. But um, I want to invite all of you who are listening, who have joined in the audience to support this program. You've seen some links show up in the chat box. Uh, love for you to donate and help both organizations. Um, and uh, we look forward to um, another program that we can collaborate on. So thank you.